This is a Marshall Enterprises presentation. Peace, everybody. Welcome back. And going through my archives, I came across this document when you, um, well, let me speak to, for myself. When I assist people with their paperwork or I am doing research, let me go back to the first, <laughs> assisting people with their paperwork, I go back in my archives of cases and different pieces of information that I feel would be great to add into my own paperwork. You want to make these processes and these, um, or let's say just leave them alone process. You want to make these processes your own. You do not want to get a boilerplate template and send to these people because it's not going to work. It's okay to use bits and pieces of other information to help bolster your paperwork. So with that being said, I want to read you a letter, a very, very powerful letter that was very well written. And because I enjoy reading and some of my friends do not enjoy reading, they like to hear me talk or they like to have things read to them, consider this an audio book. <laughs> We're going to read the letter on money. This is coming from mediafire.com. Actually, let me backtrack. On the paper that I printed out, mediafire.com is referenced. But this is coming from the federalmafia.homestead.com. Letter on money. Such and such and such LLP, such and such and such state bar number. Attorney is alleging um, representing the plaintiff. Certified mail. This is a, a document that was made up, but we're going to assume it was sent to this individual and the individual is going to respond to them. In the month of whenever, such and such and so, 1234 Liberty Way for Freedom XX, 123456. Dear Mr. X's, it is obvious that you and your paralegal, XXXX, do not understand the simple fact that there is no money in circulation and that you cannot demand paper instruments backed by credit. You obtained a money judgment, not a credit judgment, from a judge that lost subject matter jurisdiction the moment I accepted the presentment for full dollar value and tendered a dollar money order, a one dollar money order. It is a principle of law universally accepted that a judge cannot make a legal determination on a settled account. Once the debt alleged in a petition is accepted for full dollar value, jurisdiction is lost. There is no longer any controversy and the court can only retain jurisdiction as long as there is a controversy against which a judgment can operate. Hence, any judgment rendered after acceptance of full dollar value may be moot because the controversy upon which jurisdiction was based no longer exists. No matter how you look at it, an acceptance for full dollar value is a settled account. Upon examining the record, you will find that the acceptance was made and a copy filed in the month 2000 whenever. And the order of the judgment was rendered on March 10th, 2000 whatever. It is self-proven that the order is a nullity and will be voided at some future date. Be that as it may, you now have the problem of execution, which must be executed by the very same trial court that lost subject matter jurisdiction. There is no money to satisfy judgment, and any attempt to seize property will be met with the injunction prohibiting sale upon the ground that the judgment obtained is absolutely null. Any motion for examination of judgment debtor will be met with the motion to quash the summons upon the same ground. This is my intent. Act as you feel compelled but be prepared to discuss money, payment, and acceptance for full dollar value. 
And in the meantime, I will continue to send $1 each month by postal money order. Whether you accept it or not is immaterial. In your letter, you say, we will be willing to accept payment in the full amount owed to our client, principal sum of $21,462.10. $21,000 of what? What are you willing to accept is not the issue. The issue is what are you legally able to demand? What kind of species of money aggregate type, M1, M2, or M3, was loaned, and are you asking for a different type to repay, be repaid? Below is a brief explanation, and I shall expect a reply, or we will just, you know, we will let the judge reply. M1 consists of one, currency outside the U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve Banks, and the vaults of depository institutions. Two, traveler's checks of non-bank issuers. Three, demand deposits at commercial banks, excluding those amounts held by depository institutions, the U.S. government, foreign banks, and official institutions. Less cash items in the process of collection and Federal Reserve float. And four, the other checkable deposits, OCDs, consists of negative a negotiable order of withdrawal and automatic transfer service, ATS, accounts at depository institutions, credit union share draft accounts, and demand deposits at thrift institutions. Seasonally, a seasonally adjusted M1 is constructed by summing currency, traveler's checks, demand deposits, and OCDs and seasonally adjusted separately. M2 money Two consists of M1 plus savings deposits, including money market account deposit accounts. Two, small denomination time deposits, time deposits in amounts of less than $100,000, less individual retirement account, IRA, and kill balance at depository institutions. And three, balance in retail money market mutual funds, less IRA and kill balance at money market mutual funds. Seasonally adjusted M2 is constructed by summing savings deposits, small denomination time deposits, and retail money funds. Each seasonally adjusted separately and, and adding this result to the seasonally adjusted M1. M3, money three, consists of M2 plus one, balances in institutional money market mutual funds, two, large denomination time deposits, time deposits in amounts of $100,000 or more. Three, repurchase agreements, RP, liabilities of depository institutions and denominations of $100,000 or more on U.S. governments and special or federal agency securities and four, euro dollars held by U.S. addressees at foreign branches of U.S. banks worldwide and at all banking offices in the United Kingdom and Canada. Large denomination time deposits, RPs, and euro dollars exclude those amounts held by depository institutions, the U.S. government, foreign banks, and official institutions, and money market mutual funds. Seasonally adjusted M3 is constructed by summing institutional money funds, large denomination time deposits, RPs, and euro dollars, each adjusted separately and adding this result to seasonally adjusted M2. An elementary explanation on money. What's a dollar? A simple question, yet no court will render a determination. Is a tuna a fish? This is not hard. And even though elementary in my approach, it is a simple means to make a simple principle understandable. So again, is tuna a fish? To those who answer yes, I most certainly agree. Since a tuna is a fish. Would 10 tuna have to be 10 fish? Absolutely. Is an apple a piece of a fruit? Yes. An apple is a piece of fruit. And 10 apples will be 10 pieces of fruit. Great. Is a dollar a piece of paper? And if you answered yes to that question, then please answer the following. 
If a dollar is a piece of paper, then why is it ten dollars, ten pieces of paper? If a dollar is a piece of paper, how could two halves, four quarters, 10 dimes, 20 nickels, or 100 pennies be a dollar? And for that matter, how can one piece of paper be 10 of anything? If I held an apple in my hand in such a way that you can only see one half of it, and then proceeded to ask you, what am I holding in my hand? Would you answer an apple? But what if, much to your surprise, I showed you the part of the apple that was concealed in my hand and I had stamped on it 10 apples, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Would you still say I had an apple or would you say now I really had 10 apples? Think about this, for you do it every day. I believe intelligent people should answer questions correctly. And of course, just because the USDA stamped 10 on my apple or the privately owned Federal Reserve prints 10 on their imaginary notes certainly doesn't make one become 10, and you know it. The law says United States money is expressed in dollars. Title 31, United States Code, Section 5101. And land in the USA is expressed in acres. So deeds to land are also expressed in acres. Although an acre is not the land, nor is dollar the money, but the unit of measure of gold and silver and coin form. Only when gold and silver are current as the money. Gold and silver have been used as money for a long time throughout history, and for very good reasons, including but not limited to, one, relatively, relative scarcity, two, doesn't rust or spoil, and three, has universal acceptance. Again, we don't need any government to force us to accept gold or silver, but they have to force us to take paper. A convenient unit of weight was needed to express gold and silver. The shekel of old letter giving way to the Troy ounce of today. But Americans officially in 1792, coinage, Mink Act of 1792, which the Boston Federal Reserve states is still the law, adopted the decimal system for weighing gold and silver, the dollar being the primary unit of measure. Nevertheless, just as gravel is measured in cubic yards, sugar in pounds, milk and milk is expressed in quartz, so too silver and gold were weighed in dollars. And since no tangible entity answers to a gravel cubic yard, sugar pound, or a milk quart, it stands to reason that no tangible commodity could answer to a gold or silver dollar. And the reason you do not have a silver dollar in your secret hiding place is the same reason you don't have a, quart, a milk quart caught in your refrigerator. That is, neither exists. Intangible units of measure are not fashioned from tangible substances. So, why do you correctly say a quart of milk and incorrectly say a silver dollar? Accurate or lawful delivery payment of a substance of thing or thing requires uh, three elements of indicia. One, numeric quantity, two, unit of measure, and three, the thing or substance being measured. In fact, without all three of the above indicia, no merchant can do business with any customer anywhere. Consider, you own a deli with the fine array of meats and cheeses, etc., and I approach you with this request. Could I please have three pounds, please? In order to fulfill my order, you need all three indicia, and I only gave you two. Quantity equal three, unit of measure equal pound. But I failed to tell you what the substance was. So you must ask, three pounds of what? Then once I tell you smoked turkey breast, you have no problem filling my order. 
So what do you do when I next order? Could I please have pounds of Swiss cheese? This time you must ask how many pounds of Swiss cheese? Get it? But now as a deli owner, you're wondering if I am the dumbest person on earth. Yes, when I ask how much is my total order, you say $10, please. And if I ask you $10 of what, you'd be dumbfounded. When we use gold and silver as the money, you would have said $10 of gold. Pricey shop you run. And we could both conduct our business. So today, $10 of what? Dollars of dollars? Do we have gallons of gallons? See the scam? Fraud and con? If you have ever seen a pre-1963 dollar bill of credit, you might have noticed a contract concealed in plain view. Who? The United States of America. Will do what? When? Pay to the bearer on demand. One dollar. What? Where? This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private, and is redeemable in lawful money at the United States Treasury or any Federal Reserve Bank. The terms lawful money or lawful money of the United States shall be construed to mean gold or silver coin of the United States. Title 12, United States Code, Section 152. Can a note that promises to pay lawful money be the lawful money? In the pre-1963 bills of credit or notes, you had to look at three different places on the face of the bill and read four different font styles of print to see the contract concealed in plain view. Now pull out a post-1963 bill of credit, any denomination if you like, and look closely at its face. Who? The United States of America, Federal Reserve note, one dollar or five, 10, et cetera. This note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. That's it. They removed the promise, and by doing so, the bill magic magically became the thing once promised, under your nose. The modern day Federal Reserve note promises nothing to no one ever. It can't be redeemed for anything. It's not federal, embraces no reserves, and is not a note. The very first person who spends one into the marketplace will give nothing for it and get anything with it. You slave. Must work for it, and if you hold on to it too long, will get nothing for it. Just as deeds to land cannot be the land, notes, promises to pay the money, or now, worse, imaginary notes with no promise to pay the money cannot be the money. Again, so what? I can spend it cry the slaves, but look beyond their elementary short-sightedness. It should be obvious that for the creators of imaginary notes, a phenomenal economic and political clout can be had for the rest of us. Serious problems. Lenin is said to have declared that the best way to destroy the capitalist system was to debauch the currency. By a continual process of inflation, governments can confiscate secretly and unobscure, unobscure, un observed an important part of the wealth of their citizens. By this method, they not only confiscate, but they confiscate arbitrarily. And while the process impoverishes many, it actually enriches some. Keynotes on inflation, 1890 annual report, Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, page six. Legalized theft of our wealth with imaginary money, given physical substance with paper and copper nickel slugs creates a dilemma since fraud of this magnitude is difficult to conceal. Our master solution, charge interest on the loans of nothing. Who would ever suspect a bank of creating imaginary, imaginary principle when everyone thinks they need more of what they're getting for nothing? But interest creates another problem. How does the non-bank public return more funny money to the banks than they pretend to lend? How can all debtors repay the principal plus interest when banks only lend principal? In other words, how do we repay four eggs on a three egg loan when the banks own all the chickens? When the banks own all the chickens? Our master's solution, just encourage the next generation to climb aboard the treadmill. By borrowing new dollars into circulation, they enable the first generation to earn that fourth egg. 
This also gives the first generation the incentive to enslave their own offspring and escape foreclosure. It is the nature of an imaginary monetary system that is ever expanding and all consuming to collapse. Public confidence in this self-destructive, it's gonna kill us all system is enhanced by one, fond memories of redeemable notes. Two, interest levied on non-loans. Three, vaults and armed guards to protect bogus IOUs. And four, public schools to delude students into exchanging assets, labor, wealth, or production. For bank liabilities, notes and checks, and call it payment instead of theft. Now for a more sophisticated explanation. In your letter, you ask for dollar sign. Professor Florian Kajori dealt with the dollar sign question rather definitely, definitively more than 60 years ago in a, his, in a history of mathematical notations and could get quite indignant on the subject. He noted in his book about a dozen different theories and on the dollar sign signs or origin have been advanced by men of imaginary minds. But none of these would-be historians permitted himself to be hampered by the underlying facts. Among the deficient hypothesis, one, the dollar sign was originally the letters U and S superimposed. The idea here is that the original dollar sign had two vertical lines, not one. Popular though this idea is, there is zero documentary evidence for it. Furthermore, Robert Morris, the Revolutionary War financier and the first U.S. official to use the sign, made it with a single vertical stroke. It's a version of the letters IHS, the Greek abbreviation of the name Jesus. No further comment required. Three, it is originally a P combined with an eight. The dollar, you'll recall, is descended from the Spanish mill dollar also known as the piece of eight, because it consisted of eight reels. Plausible, and as we shall see, not that far from the truth, but still wrong. Four, the dollar sign was inspired by the Spanish pillar dollar, which on one side had the two columns signifying the pillars of Hercules at Gibraltar, these were represented in a dollar sign by the two vertical lines, with the S being some sort of scroll wrapped around them. In reality, Professor Kajori contends in his book, the dollar sign is an abbreviation for pesos. Bear in mind the Spanish dollar, also known as the pesos, the eight reals, was the principal coin in circulation in the U.S. up until 1794 when we began minting our own money. In handwriting, pesos was usually abbreviated lowercase ps, with s above and to the right of the p, and with the hook on the latter written with one or two deep strokes. As time went on, the p and the s tended to get smashed together, and the result was the dollar sign. The dollar sign and the PS abbreviation were used interchangeably from around 1775 until the end of the century, after which the latter faded from view. Professor Kajori backs up his argument with examples from manuscripts of the period. It is thought by some that the changes from double stroke to single stroke dollar signs parallel changes from, from asset-backed currency to credit-backed currency. It appears that nobody really knows or has any documentary evidence as to the meaning of the single and or double line dollar sign until one studies a one dollar stamp. Close examination of such will immediately re reveal that somebody certainly knows the difference between the symbol. A bill or judgment for the dollar sign or the dollar does not support an action. If someone knows what a dollar is, then the court must surely know because the judgment hearing contains the single line dollar sign and without clarification, it is impossible for blank blank to know what it means in this action. Therefore, clarification is mandatory so that I can comply with your payment request. I cannot tender a dollar until I know what a dollar is. Now for my legal position. 
I am a student of monetary law and have studied this issue extensively for the last several years. And thus, I sincerely believe that my views on the subject have weight, merit, and authority. I have also requested my local public servants to provide me a similar determination, but I have been unsuccessful in this respect. The conclusion I've reached in reference to this failure of public officials to answer these basis, basis questions posed by citizens is that these officials have no knowledge of monetary law. Since I suspect you likewise may have some misconception in your own mind concerning this topic, I would like to offer you my views and opinions in a Christian spirit. The common monetary unit in circulation in our country prior to and during the Revolutionary War was the Spanish mill dollar. This coin was so prevalent that the word dollar was commonly understood by all people to be a reference to this coin. When the Constitution was drafted in 1787 and later ratified by the states in 1788, the constitutional references to dollars in this instrument meant these coins. During the period of time that the Articles of Confederation were enforced, the Confederate Congress made a factual determination that the dollar was the basis a basic monetary unit of our country. By 1792, the Congress under the Constitution made a factual determination that the dollar was a weight of silver consisting of 371.25 grains of pure silver. See, one stat, 246. This was the first act of Congress in reference to the subject of money. And there have been additional congressional acts adopted since the Coinage Act of 1792. But these acts have culminated in such a fashion as to only confusion in the field of monetary law. A recitation of all the coinage acts of Congress is pointless here, although I would be happy to provide these sites to you. Acts and regards were adopted, among other times, in 1834, 1837, 1878, 1900, 1933, 1934, and 1967. But in reference to the sites of acts of Congress, in reference to the term dollar, it is acts passed since 1972 and 1976 by Congress, which clearly led to the confusion so prevalent today in regards to the subject of monetary law. Georgia follows the common law and, of course, the common law is most important in reference to the subject of monetary law. At common law, the monetary standard of a nation was immutable, meaning that it could not be changed by any legislative body. This principle is expounded by many common law authorities and is an established principle of law. This being the case, Congress lacks all power to change the ancient monetary standard of our nation, which is a dollar of silver defined in the Coinage Act of 1792. I am fully cognizant of the fact that there exist many powerful influ influential advocates that maintain that the monetary standard is immutable, meaning that it can be changed by Congress. These partisans further maintain that all power over the monetary standard is vested in the hands of Congress. If you accept this premise, then it logically follows that a dollar is today a legal fiction. The last definition of a dollar via federal statute was contained in the Par Value Modification Act of Month 31, 1972, 86 Stat 116, formerly 31 U.S. Section 449. Section 2 of this act defined a dollar as being equal to 1 38th of a fine troy ounce of gold. In the alternative, in the alternative, $38 equaled an ounce of such fine gold. This definition of a gold dollar was in effect until October 19, 1976, when Congress adopted the act to amend the Bretton Woods Agreement, 90 Stat 2660. Section 6 of this act repealed Section 2 of the Par Value Modification Act. Since that time, Congress has totally failed and refused to enact any legislation defining a dollar. If you accept the argument that Congress possesses total control over the monetary standard, then you must also accept the proposition that a dollar is today a legal fiction. It is indeed odd that our entire economy and society operate upon an entity which is unknown and legally undefined. Another point I would like to make with you concerns the Federal Reserve note. Many people contend that Federal Reserve notes are legal tender pursuant to 31 U.S.C. section 3103. But notwithstanding the statute, 
one must look to the substance instead of the form to determine if such notes are really legally legal tender. The essential attribute of any legal tender currency is that it must be in fact an obligation of the United States. To be an obligation of the United States, Congress must have adopted an act authorizing the issuance of some quantity of these notes, and the same must be enforced against the United States. However, I have not found any statute whereby Congress has authority or authorize any amount of these notes to be issued. And since this is the case, such notes are not United States obligations and are not legal tender. Further, these notes are not enforceable against the United States. The ultimate hypocrisy is that these notes are not even enforceable against the banks, which issue them. I have studied the matter for 20 years and written an extensive brief on the point that Federal Reserve notes are not legal tender. tender which I will save to counter any erroneous position taken in any official determination. I hope that the points I am making in this letter are perceptible to you. There is a real and substantial issue concerning what is legally a dollar, with on one extreme it being contended that a dollar is a weight of silver, and on the other extreme it is being contended that a dollar is a legal fiction. Further. Some people contend that the Federal Reserve notes are legal tender and others answer that they are not. And then with these and these people who contend otherwise, including myself, have the weight of law to support their argument. With such obvious confusion, it is only natural I cannot pay a dollar of liability in any judgment or settlement. It is a well-known fact that a court that does not have a remedy has no subject matter jurisdiction to create one unless such is contracted. In this instant, there is no remedy because, no pay, because payment of a judgment and money of account expressed in dollars and pursuant to HDR 192, there, is, there, there are no lawful dollars in circulation. Since HDR 192, we can only discharge a liability with the approval of John W. Snow, Secretary of the Treasury. If John W. Snow does not give his approval, any judgment, settlement, debt can only become an enforceable and expensive nullity. As a matter of law, the money accounts of this state must be expressed in dollars or units, cents or hundredths, in mills or thousandths, and all accounts in banks and public offices, and all proceedings in this court of the state shall be kept in conformity herewith. Since the state must express its judgment in dollars, an efficient determination is mandatory to eliminate confusion and performance. So I can legally and lawfully pay, settle or discharge the claim with dollars or by the bill of exchange remedy found in House Dream Resolution 192. The matter is further complicated by the fact that the state is prohibited from making paper a tender in payment of debt. See Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution of the United States, which states, no state shall make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debt. A check with the Georgia Secretary of State clearly shows that is, in his opinion, Article 1, Section 10 is binding upon the state of Georgia. So as you see, or so as you can see, in view of these authorities, statutes, resolutions, and articles, I have no remedy or way to comply with the payment of dollars or the money you requested or the dollar you requested, and therefore must conditionally accept for value and return for value your presentment pending an official determination of a dollar, expressing your claim or tender a dollar money order, a one dollar money order, each month until Congress puts back into circulation. I have no duty to pay, your, pay you or MBA anything unless you submit proof of claim that there is a way to pay the dollars you are demanding. Additionally, every competent jurisdiction knows that the created cannot possess a power that the creator did not have to give. The state of Georgia does not have the power to make paper a tender in payment of debt, and neither does any corporation created by the state of federal government, state or federal government. Such would be an act of ultra virus. Years of research clearly shows that the United States is without a dollar of public or lawful money. All we have today is private Federal Reserve unbacked credit dollars, which are not money or property and only confers with the user an equitable interest but denies a loyal title. It is no accident that the United States is without a dollar unit coin. 
In recent years, the Eisenhower dollar coin received widespread acceptance, but the treasury minted them in limited number, which encouraged hoarding. The same fate befell the Kennedy half dollars, which circulated as silver sandwich clads between 1965 to 1969 and were hoarded for their intrinsic value and not spent. Next came the Susan B. Anthony dollar, an awkward coin which instantly rejected as planned. The remaining unit is the privately issued Federal Reserve note unit dollar, which is not money, C-105, so 305, 1925, with no viable competitors. Back in 1935, the Fed had persuaded the Treasury to discontinue minting silver dollars because the public preferred them over dollar bills. That the public money system has become awkward. Discouraging this use is no accident. It was planned that way. There's no way to plug a judicial, judicial, judicial judgment into private money system pursuant to Article 1, Section 10. I clearly would love to litigate any premise counter to these assertions. Something is greatly wrong in this country, and it doesn't originate with the sovereign people who ask pointed, pointed and inquiring questions of public servants. Being one of those sovereign people, I am unable to pay any judgment or settlement without an efficient determination. As a lawyer, you are an officer of the court and as such should be able to get an efficient determination of what kind of dollar settles a proceeding in a state court. Providing that determination, I shall tender payment in the kind of dollars shown in the determination. Conclusion. Now back to your letter when you state, we will be willing to accept payment in full dollar amount owed to our client, principal sum $21,462.10. What do you want payment with? What does the dollar sign, what does the sign dollar you use represent? Are you aware that payment is against declared public policy pursuant to House Joint Resolution 192 of June 5th, 1933? I would love to comply, but all I can do is tender my endorsement and a one dollar postal money order each month until Congress places money or dollars back into circulation or the court declares what is lawful to demand, which no court has expressed a desire to do. Again, I emphasize that you cannot plug a judicial, a judicial judgment into a paper money system backed by credit. There is no remedy. For all legal purposes, the account is closed. Why the tender of a $1 money order? Because of the fact that no money exists to pay a debt, all demand for payment are demands for money. Since no money exists, all one has is his or her signature and exemption number to pay a debt. Federal Reserve notes, FRNs, do not pay a debt. Federal Reserve notes only distinguishes debt. By using FRNs, the debt is not paid, but it's only transferred to another account unpaid. Therefore, I can only accept and return the presentment or judgment herein by accepting the debt for value and return for value. The judgment herein is accepted for value and re returned for value as consideration for settlement and closure of account. X66 accepts the full dollar value of offer as the current balance due. Unless you present proof of claim that there is a way to pay and a medium to pay and a medium to pay when the account is settled in full and closed. What you are willing to accept is insignificant. I hope this letter enlightens you on the matter and you do not act foolishly and get this matter into the appellate courts. This led us to inform you that as a matter of law, the account is closed. With kindest regards, I am very truly yours. Signed, XX, 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 one, two, three, four, Liberty Way, for freedom. This has been a tremendous education and a tremendous display of information that you can definitely use in defense of your processes. This has been a letter on money from the Federal Mafia .com. This is Bud Brownsville, Bud Brownsville LLC, and this has been a Marshall Enterprises presentation. Thank you.